All right, well today uh, we're going to look at the, the last of these three examples of the world coming to Christ that we were given in chapters 8 through 11 uh, in the book of Acts. And, and you remember there's three different people with three different backgrounds uh, from three different parts of the world. The Ethiopian eunuch in chapter 8, uh, Saul uh, the Pharisee from Tarsus in chapter 9, and Cornelius the Italian centurion today uh, right here in chapter 10. And again, you remember God scattered the people across the earth at the Tower of Babel. And, and the descendants of Noah's son Ham settled, settled in Africa, where the Ethiopian eunuch was from. Uh, the descendants of Noah's son Shem settled in the Middle East, where Saul of Tarsus was from. And, and the descendants of Noah's son Japheth settled in the north, or Europe, uh, where Cornelius the Italian centurion is from. And so, remember, the whole world was populated by these three sons of Noah. And so, in a way, these three men that we've been looking at, and, and we'll look at today, uh, in a way, they represent the world coming to Christ. Uh, and it's really cool. You know, God, he, pray, he paid the price for our, our sin, and it's for everyone. It's for every person, no matter what background, no matter what country, no matter what people group. The good news of Jesus is for every person uh, that is alive and, and that will ever live. And uh, so we saw the Ethiopian eunuch. He came to a saving faith in Jesus Christ and then publicly uh, proclaiming that through baptism. You remember God used Philip to explain the written word of God to the Ethiopian. And, and Philip introduced this man to Jesus through the written word of God. And, and next we saw Saul, the Pharisee from Tarsus. He encountered Jesus in person. Uh, apparently that is what was required for Saul to believe. You know, physically seeing and, and hearing a manifestation of the risen Jesus himself. Today we're going to see God using a vision uh, as his vehicle to bring salvation to a person. And we left off there in the end of chapter 9, uh, just as God had raised this girl Tabitha or Dorcas. You remember? Dor Dorcas, that's kind of fun to say. And... and uh, he raised her, God raised her from the dead through the servant Peter. And, uh, and then in, so in verse 43 of chapter 9 it says, And Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. Well, you remember Peter is also called Simon. That's his name. And so we have Simon and Simon here. And, and it's no relation to the TV show that I'm aware of. Uh, but that was a cool show. You guys remember that? And, uh, and this is very significant. Not, not the TV show, but, but that Peter would stay in the house of a tanner, someone that prepares the hides of animals for use, like a leather worker. Uh, in Leviticus, we're told that handling dead animals, uh, it would make a, personal, a person ceremonially unclean uh, for the day. And so if that's your occupation, you're pretty much unclean all the time. And, uh, and so for Peter, a man raised in this Jewish custom, this was significant for him to stay in a house that would be unclean. Uh, a Pharisee would have never in, even entertained the thought of staying uh, in an unclean house with an unclean person. And so God is already working in Peter to, to adjust this Jewish mindset. And, and he's beginning to reveal to Peter that Jesus paid the price for the sins of all mankind. That salvation was not just for the Jews, but it was for the whole world. And, and God just brought it through to the world through the Jews. You remember God set apart the Jews for this special purpose, to bring his, spe his uh, precious son into the world through. But, but as we're, we're even told by Jesus himself in John 3.16, most of you know this, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever or whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. The world. And then in Matthew 8.11, it says, I say to you that many will come from the east and west and recline at the table with Abram, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And so even though God raised a person from the dead through Peter, which speaks very highly of Peter's spiritual maturity and his faith, I mean, Peter, he's like up there, right? He, not only is he one of the 12 apostles, he was one of the three that, that Jesus had set apart from the 12, um, James, John, and Peter. And, and uh, God is working these incredible miracles in and through Peter, right? He just raised uh, Tabitha from the dead. But guess what? 
Peter is still in process. God is still growing Peter. God is uh, not done molding and shaping Peter into the person that he would have Peter to be. And and I find this fact very uh, encouraging. It's really encouraging because, uh, you know, God has a lot of work to do in me. Uh, This this in process or this under construction sign, it's going to be posted on me for a long time. And uh, and so seeing this sign posted in Peter's life here is encouraging. And, uh, you know, not only from the perspective of, you know, someone might say, well, well, Rob, uh, a pastor, isn't he supposed to be perfect, you know? And, and well, let me tell you, if, if the apostles aren't perfect, you know, then, then who am I, right? And, uh, but what, what is really encouraging is the fact that God is interested in perfecting Peter. And God is interested in perfecting me, and, and God is interested in perfecting you. Uh, God is in, interested in perfecting us and and this is not a chore to god Uh, he desires to work in and through us Um, he loves molding and shaping us especially when we're willing i mean any teacher uh you know you ask any teacher what a joy it is to have a student that wants to learn and peter is most certainly a willing student here Uh, i think he's a little hard-headed but but nonetheless he's willing and so that brings us to acts chapter 10 verse 1 And it says, now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, He said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Isn't that cool? And then in verse five, now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter, for he is staying with Tanner named a Tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. So Cornelius was a centurion, meaning he was an officer in the Roman military that was in charge of a hundred men, one hundred men, and it's part of this Italian regiment. And Cornelius was a de- was devout and God fearing. We're told. However, he had not been circumcised, and and so he was not a full fledged uh, proselyte to to Judaism. And he certainly had not yet entered into God's salvation through Jesus Christ. And, and we're told he prayed continually, and that's awesome, isn't it? And so here it is, the ninth hour, and that's about three in the afternoon. And Cornelius has a vision. And now, if it were me at three in the afternoon, it would have been a dream. Uh, because at three in the afternoon, if I'm not physically moving up on my feet, I mean, I'm, I'm down for the count. I'm dead in the water. And uh, I, I used to have a, a dentist that was located on the way home from work. And so I would make my appointments uh, about three o'clock and just stop on the way home. It made sense, right? <clears throat> when I worked day shift. And uh, so it wasn't too long before I developed this reputation there in the office. You know, they began to make comments to me as I'm signing in. Oh, Mr. Ifland, are you ready for your nap? You know, or when I'm leaving, how was your nap today? And, and one time, I'm not exaggerating, one time I actually fell asleep while the dentist was drilling my tooth uh, for a filling. And he had to stop and wake me up and, and to continue. And, you know... I mean, I don't know, but but uh, all I know is that the Mexicans are on to something with this afternoon siesta time. And I mean, forget the Cinco de Mayo. Well, America needs to adopt the uh, siesta time. Um, so so Cornelius, although <clears throat> we're told he prayed continually, we're not told here if he stopped, you know, and got on his knees and and assumed a, a dedicated posture of prayer. But but later when he recounts this to Peter, he says that he was praying. When he received this vision and a vision is is a picture in the mind's eye, so to speak. It's similar to a dream, but you're awake. And and it's it's the same idea as God speaking to us in our inner man or in our spirit. And and if you you can look at it like this, when we when we hear a sound uh, like we were hearing today or right now, your eardrum vibrates and the the vibrations, they're, they're transmitted from the eardrum. Uh, through these tiny little bones, the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, and then they're converted to electrical impulses by the cochlea. 
And then they're sent uh, along the auditory nerve to the brain. So these, these uh, vibrations uh, are converted to an electrical impulse. And so most often when God speaks to us, he kind of skips all that mess. And he just sends the signal right to our brain uh, or to our spirit. And so with the vision, it's the same way. You know, the, the, the complexity of the eye, it converts that image to an electrical signal. And then that's transmitted to our brain through the optical nerve. And so a vi- with a vision or a dream, again, God kind of skips the middleman and he just sends the signal. And so we will see uh, when Cornelius recounts this to Peter, he says a man stood before him in shining garments. And so this signal that God sent was so clear, it, it was like an angel was actually standing there. Uh, but we're told it's a vision. Uh, So Cornelius, he sees this vision, uh, this guy standing there, and he's alarmed, he's afraid, and and he responds, what is it, Lord? And the angel says, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. And so what does Cornelius do? Does he write a letter to dear Abby or to Dr. Phil to help reason away this vision, you know, and and conclude that something uh, traumatic must have happened to him as a child, and, and he needs to confront that trauma, and he needs to work through all that so he can stop having these visions. Is that what happens? Well, let's see. In Acts uh, chapter 10, verse 7, it says, When the, orange, the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were, in, who were his personal attendants, And after he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So so Cornelius, he gets a word from the Lord, a direction from the Lord, through this vision of an angel, and he follows the direction. I mean, imagine that. As, As simple as that sounds, I think most of us, you know, most people today would probably choose to go the Dr. Phil route there. You know, maybe I need to take a pill for this thing, or or maybe it's because I'm taking so many pills I'm having these visions, and uh, and uh, and maybe that's why it doesn't seem to happen so often. You know, these days. Uh, notice uh, Cornelius; he wasn't a- afraid or embarrassed to share the details of this vision to others. Uh, he says he grabbed these two servants and the soldier and explained everything to them, and then he sent them. He obeyed the Lord's direction. Verse 9 says, On the next day, as they were on their way approaching the city, Peter went up on a housetop about the sixth hour to pray. But he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance, and he saw the sky opened up, and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were, and there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures, of the earth and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. So now, God's going to speak to the other end of the deal here. Uh, Like he so often does. God so often confirms his directions on both ends, on both sides. You know, if someone comes to me and says, says, Hey, uh, Rob, the, the Lord spoke to me about you. Uh, he says you need to move to the Galapagos Islands and start preaching to lizards. You know, uh, I'll certainly keep that in mind. I mean, how could you not? But until the Lord tells me directly or confirms it with me, you know, the house ain't going up for sale. I mean, God, God usually confirms these things uh, with us. And, and so Peter, he goes up on the roof. Now, these were flat roofs. It was like a patio or a deck up there. So this wasn't some strange thing. Uh, like we would be on the roof, but it's more like going out on the porch or, or the back deck to pray. And notice Peter is praying as well, uh, as, like Cornelius was. And do we have to be in an attitude of prayer to receive a vision from God? I don't think you have to be on your knees, you know, with your hands folded, but I think you need to be in an attitude of prayer. Like, like Paul says, praying without ceasing. And, and so, you're still living and doing things, but there's an awareness. Uh, there's there's an open dialogue with the Lord. Uh, your your instant messaging is turned on, or or you're always ready to receive a message from God, ready to send a message. Uh, you know, for example, your your coworker seems a little down. Uh, 
you, you just lift them up right there to the Lord in the hallway, you know, as you walk by. You don't, you don't have to necessarily get on your knees. <clears throat> you don't have to close your eyes and, and fold your hands, you know, and, and, and closing your eyes, that, it, the reason we do that, it just helps us from being uh, distracted, you know, and, and folding your hands, it just kind of keeps you, you know, from fiddling with things like this, and Pam's going to come up here and take this away from me, but... Uh, <laughs> And that's why we tell, like, the kids, fold your hands. It's so they, you, they're not causing distractions by fiddling with things. And I have a bad habit of doing that. But nonetheless, so you, it's like your phone is on, the ringer's turned up, you're, you're ready for God to call at any moment, uh, you know, and ready to talk to him. And so here Peter is. Uh, he's hungry, it's lunchtime, and, and he goes out to pray while lunch is being prepared, and he really gets into it. He, he says he's like in this trance, and, and then he has a vision. And this giant bed sheet comes down from the sky, and there's all sorts of animals uh, crawl, and crawling things and birds on it, and a voice says, you know, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And, uh, you know, Peter says, yes, sir, right? I, I've always wanted to try bacon. You know, here, piggy, 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 right? No. Peter, the man that, that God's used to perform miraculous healings, even, even raising Tabitha from the dead, the very same Peter says, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Now, this is a complete contradiction in terms. It makes no sense whatsoever. Lord means master. Uh, when someone is Lord or master over you, then you do what they say. If you don't, then they're not your Lord or your Master. You might, you might call them that, but, but it's a lie. It's not the truth. You know, it's like, it's like saying, you know, uh, so-and-so is my lead mechanic. And you say, oh, so you follow their directions. No, no, are you kidding? That guy doesn't have a clue. I don't listen to him. Well, so you call him your lead mechanic, but you don't actually follow his directions. Well, yeah. Uh, and so, uh, not really, i got a pretty good lead mechanic, but so... You, you call Jesus Lord, but you don't actually do what he says. And, uh, and that is what Peter is doing here. And remember, he's in process. Peter's in process. And God's growing Peter. And, and, uh, and so God is telling people, I mean, he's telling Peter, I set apart uh, a people for myself, the Jewish people, and, and they were to dress a certain way and act a certain way and eat a certain way. Outwardly, they were to be different so that the world would know that these people were set apart by God, that these were a special people. You know, it was like a billboard pointing to God for the world to see. Well, now in Christ, God's people have been changed inwardly. And so that inward change, it flows out in their actions. Uh, the Holy Spirit flows out of them in their actions. And so that alone sets them apart in ways that a, a dress code or a diet uh, could ever do. <clears throat> and God says, I'm lifting this dietary restriction so that you can relate to the world, Peter, so that, so that you can meet the, per, the world where they are and then bring them to me, introduce them to me. <clears throat> Verse 15, again a voice came to him a second time, what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. And calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. So Peter's not getting it. Uh, he, he's confused. He's perplexed, it says. Uh, you know, he'd been taught his whole life that these animals are ceremonially unclean to eat. Yet God is saying they are now clean. And he, and he doesn't understand the purpose behind it and how God has, has used those things to, to set them apart from the world. But now that the Holy Spirit is freely given to all who ask, the Spirit is living in and through us. And that sets us apart, you know, a thousand times more than a few rules ever could. Uh, and so if, if Peter would just look at his own life, how God is now reaching people as he's working these miracles through him, through and, and in Peter. You know, God is reaching people through Peter that he never could have before uh, because of the Holy Spirit that's in him. And then in 19 it says, While Peter was reflecting on the vision, 
The spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you, but get up and go downstairs and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. Peter went down to the, to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason that you have come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. So he invited them in and gave them lodging. So Peter is reflecting on this vision. He's trying to make sense of it. He's trying to figure it out, and which is exactly what he should be doing. And then the Spirit says, Behold, these three men are looking for you. He says, Get up, go downstairs, and, and go with them without reservations, for I have sent them myself. And so Peter says, You know, hey, hold on to your horses, man. I'm not doing anything until I figure all this mess out, right? Leave me alone. You know, where was I? No, Peter doesn't say that, right? Peter listened and obeyed uh, this time. And, and I'm sure he's thinking, Maybe this will tie it all together. You know, maybe maybe God will help me understand as I go. As is the case so often when with when God is leading and directing us, molding and shaping us, you know, rarely does he fill in all the details. He he usually just gives us a step or two at a time. And so Peter comes downstairs and he says, "Hey, I'm the guy you're looking for. You know, what's up?" And, and they and they told uh, they told him about Cornelius and his vision and how Cornelius invited Peter uh, over to give them a message. And uh, now I would be thinking, you know, what message? Uh, you know, God didn't give me any message for them. And, uh, you know, you just said go with them. But Peter, he has some faith and, and he knows God will fill in the details as he goes. And, and he follows. And so Peter uh, invites them in for the night before they leave for the, you know, the next day. And then in verse 23b, and on the next day he got up and went away with them, and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. On the following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up, saying, Stand up, I too am just a man. And as he talked with them, he entered uh and found many people assembled. So Cornelius has a house full here. Uh, he knew Peter was coming with a message from God, even though Peter didn't know what it was yet. And uh, but God, you know, got the wheels turning in Peter's brain. And 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 nonetheless, Cornelius is like, if God has a message, then I want everyone uh, that I know, I want everyone that I care about to hear this message. And so he invites his family and his friends, and they're all there, and they're waiting to hear what God has to say through Peter. Verse 28, And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. That is why I came without even raising an objection when I was sent for. So I ask, for what reason do you have, do you have, for what reason you have sent for me? So Peter understands what God was saying about the clean and unclean animals. It wasn't, it wasn't so much about the animals being clean now, uh, as it was the people that eat those animals are clean. And so instead of avoiding them because they'll rub off on you and make you unclean, God wants to use Peter and, and God wants wants us to introduce these people to Jesus. Uh, our God wants to use Peter and us the same way to, to introduce people to Jesus. And, and, you know, God, he'll make the people clean from the inside out. And so Peter is like, uh, well, the purpose of my vision was to, to let me know it was okay to, to hang out with you guys here. And so what's up? You know, why did you call me here? Um, you know, what reason have you sent for me? Now that he's got this vision figured out. And then in verse 30, Cornelius said, Four days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour. And behold, a man stood before me in shining garments. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Therefore, send to Joppa and invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon, the tanner by the sea.
And uh, there's a picture of the two, if you can see that. That's Simon and Simon and uh, by the sea, or actually they're on the sea, it appears there. And it's kind of hard to tell in that picture which one of them is the tanner of the two. But I think the one with the hat. But anyway, uh, verse 33, he says, So I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. You know, and I would be thinking, you know, hello, Lord. I I was walking for two days to get here. It sure would have been nice if you kind of gave me a topic or something to preach on here. I mean, I could have been thinking about it the whole time. Uh, uh, I didn't know I was kind of the headlining headlining speaker of this gig here at, at this house full of people. And, you know, he looks up and And there's this crowd of people staring at him. And, you know, I could imagine the sweat running down his face. And, you know, he's scrambling for words and and thoughts, but nothing's coming out. Oh, well, yeah, uh, see, mm, uh, you know, could I get a glass of water? You know, yeah, I like it fresh from the well. Go ahead and trawl it. We can wait. You know, I got to come up with something. But that's not Peter. In verse 34, it says, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the men who fear him, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Verse 39, we are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is to us who ate and drank with him after he rose, arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and to solemnly test to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Peter didn't hesitate uh, because He didn't have a sermon prepared. No, he realized that these people did not know Jesus. And so first things first, Peter needs to introduce Jesus to them. And that's exactly what he does. Uh, First, he tells them about Jesus. He tells them what he knows about Jesus. That God is not partial. That all are welcome. That Jesus preached peace. That Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus was anointed by God with the Holy Spirit and power. Uh, Jesus did good deeds and healed all those oppressed by the devil. And God was with Jesus. Peter tells them of his encounter with Jesus. He says, we are witnesses to these things. And uh, they executed Jesus, and he rose from the dead on the third day, and then he ate with us. This is his personal account. Jesus, uh, or Peter says, Jesus ordered them to preach these things. And then, most importantly, Jesus tells them the purpose, or Peter tells them the purpose of Jesus being born onto this earth. And that was for the forgiveness of sins to everyone who believes. And what was the response? In verse 44, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message, and the cir- and all the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. Peter didn't even give a chance to give an invitation. You see, 
He had already introduced Jesus to them, and obviously they believed, and the Spirit came upon them, and they were speaking in tongues and exalting God. So often we, we try to put uh, God in a box, or we try to put him on a flow chart here, right? And, and you know, first we invite people to church, then the pre- preacher asks them to raise their hand, uh, and then he gives them an invitation to come forward, and then he tells them to say a few words uh, to God, a prayer, and then pow, you know, we get another notch in our belt, right? And it can happen like that, but certainly it doesn't always. Just like we see here, Peter gave them a personal introduction to Jesus. He shared Jesus in a personal, powerful, and truthful way, and they believed, and the Spirit of God came upon them. But they didn't get a chance to raise their hand or to come forward or or to say the sinner's prayer. They just believed, and God saved them. And that is all there is to it. Uh, we, we just looked at John 3.16 uh, earlier. Did it say anything about raising your hand or coming forward or saying a little prayer to God? It just says, whosoever believes. Now, does it hurt to raise your hand or to come forward or to say a prayer? Most certainly not. But that's not what saves you. We are saved by God's grace through faith. We are saved by God's unearned merit. That's what grace is. We are saved by God's unearned merit through believing it, through faith, just believing it. That's all there is to it. Did you know, notice what Peter said in verse 42? He says, And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Well, who did Jesus order to tell people about him? Oh, was it just the ordained pastors or was it just the 12 apostles? No, all his disciples, all his followers. If you are a believer in Jesus, then you've been ordered to testify, not just in this scripture. Jesus tells all his followers. We've been ordered to testify, to bear witness or to tell what you know about Jesus. You don't have to tell them everything. You just have to tell them what you know. And you tell them about your personal encounter with Jesus. And then you tell them the purpose of Jesus being born on this earth. For the forgiveness of sins to everyone who believes.